Thank you, Heinrich, for that reminder from that great Protestant hymn. Do you remember those words? Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. Isn't that a powerful fact? Thank you, Heinrich, for singing that song. And thank you for, to Shay, to Joe, to Marlene for the invitation to be here. It's a privilege to spend this weekend with you at your very first camp meeting. And we anticipate an incredible blessing for God because despite the difficulties, the camp meeting is still going on. Amen? Amen. Um, Shay said I should say a little bit about the ministry that we head up, Hepzibah Ministries, its sole focus, its sole focus is to help people prepare for what is inevitable. Jesus Christ is going to come, and there's going to be a whole generation of people who are going to meet him. And that generation needs to be ready, because the warfare is going to intensify, get more fierce, and get more ferocious as the days and weeks go by. And we are that generation, we are that generation who have the privilege to see Jesus burst through the clouds and come. So it's not just the second coming, it's all the events that could precede it, you know, the great time of trouble, the little time of trouble, the shaking. We've got to prepare for all of these things. And now is the time to prepare. So if I was to um, just summarize this whole weekend for you is this. Jesus Christ coming is imminent. Jesus Christ coming is imminent. We need to prepare completely. And that preparation will change everything about our lives. It will change where we live, what we eat, how we dress, what we watch on TV. It will change everything about our lives, this preparation. So that is it in a nutshell your life will change the moment you realize and start to act on the fact that Jesus Christ coming is imminent. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you as people who need you desperately. Satan is working tirelessly to keep your people asleep. But the signs are all about us that you are coming open up our eyes and ears speak to us lord we pray this in Jesus' name amen. amen today's sermon um is entitled omens omens so jesus gave a lot of details about his coming in Matthew chapter 24. And you've read through it numerous times. And then in chapter 25, he jumps into some illustrations about the second coming. And the very first illustration he gives, do you remember what it is? The parable of the wise and foolish virgins. That parable of the wise and foolish is virgins. So... There we go. And in that parable, Jesus says this, and at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps. So I have a question for you. I have a question. And the question is this, who gave that cry at midnight? Who gave that cry at midnight? Let me help you with the answer. I believe that there are people who are awake. There are people who are watching now, looking for the signs of the second coming. And when they saw, in this parable situation, when they saw signs that the bridegroom was coming, perhaps there were some lights in the distance, perhaps it was the sound of music. When they saw or heard those sounds, they alerted everybody else and they said, Jesus Christ Sorry, they said the bridegroom is coming. In like manner today, 
there are those people who have seen the signs and they are awakening everybody else that Jesus Christ is coming. Now, my next question for you is this. How is God communicating with us about the nearness of his coming? I know he communicates with us through nature and, and through the word and through... No, but how does he specifically communicate with us about the nearness of his second coming? Now, I'm going to give you three ways in which God is clearly communicating with his people, telling them that his coming is imminent. Way number one, way number one, you can write this down, okay? The way number one is through Bible prophecy, through Bible prophecy. Now, Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says this, Surely the Lord will do... Come on church now. Surely the Lord will do what? He will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret into his servants, the prophets. That means whenever God is going to do something major... He first lets us know through his prophets. So God isn't going to do anything significant, important, uh, substantial without first revealing it to a prophet and the prophet making it known to the people with whom it's going to be important. Okay? So the second coming is kind of major. But let me give you an example of how God uses prophecy, prophecy, Bible prophecy, to... Um, comforted people to alert his people to warn his people let's go to the crucifixion of jesus christ so jesus christ is being crucified he's hung up between earth and sky he's in agony as he's stretched out on the cross he, the the uh, the nails are through his hands and feet the spares in his side he's he's in immense pain he's immense pain what is going through Jesus' mind at that time? What is going through Jesus' mind? We have an indication of what's going through Jesus' mind when we read John chapter 19, verse 28, where it says this. After this, Jesus knowing that, what? Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, save I first. Jesus is hanging on the cross, immense pain and he's thinking not about the pain he's going through not about whether it's worth it he's thinking what does bible prophecy say that's what's going through his mind he's thinking what does bible prophecy say now somewhere previously he had read this text in psalm 69 verse 21 they gave me also gall for my meat and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink so as jesus is dying on the cross he's thinking he's thinking will this prophecy be fulfilled will even this small prophecy now when we think of david we don't think of him as a, a prophet not like daniel and isaiah and jeremiah and, and john the revelator we, we think of david as a king we think of him as a warrior we even think of him as a musician and this prophecy is tucked away in a song but in the midst of that song is this phrase and jesus remembers this phrase because it is prophetic and he says, I wonder even if this small prophecy, which is, which is pointing to what I'm going through, will this small prophecy uh, come true? Because if it comes true, then I know that everything is going according to God's plan. And we know that when Jesus said, I first, what did they do? Oh, come on, church. Yeah, they got to read. As they stuck a sponge on it, they dipped it in some vinegar, and they lifted it up. And the Bible said he tasted it. That's all he needed to do. He didn't need to drink it. He just tasted it, realized it was vinegar, and said, wow, even this small prophecy came true. And then he hung his head, bowed his head, and said, it is finished. And he died. And he died. I need you to know, church, that when you're going through the little time of trouble, 
and the great time of trouble and Jacob's trouble, when you're going through those dark days, is going to be prophecy that's going to encourage you. When you know that prophecy is being fulfilled in your life, you're going to be encouraged. You will recall all these little prophecies as well as the major ones and say, wow, these are being fulfilled. And knowing that they're being fulfilled in your life is going to lift you up and bore your spirits. It's going to be such a blessing to know it. This is how important prophecy is. And as Adventists, we should be not just Bible students, but scholars of prophecy. Because we know it's going to be so important. We need to study them and know them so that when they are being fulfilled, we can say, ha, ah, look, another fulfillment of prophecy. And once again, they will encourage us. So the first way God is revealing to us is through prophecy. Um, Second Chronicles 20, 20 says this, Jehoshaphat, he's one of those kings of Judah. He's in a problem. An army is coming to destroy Jerusalem. And they have a day of prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting is important, church. And then during the prayer and fasting, a prophet says, stood up and says, you will not need to fight. The battle is not yours, it's the Lord. And then Jehoshaphat believes. And as they're marching out the next morning, he's looking at his little ragtag group of army, and he's looking at the, the worry looked on their faces, and he says to them this, Believe, O Judah and he inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, so shall he be established. In other words, your relationship with God is your foundation. It's your bedrock. bedrock. It's, the, it's the, uh, the foundation upon which everything else is built, your relationship with God. He goes on to say this, believe his prophets, so shall he prosper so if you're going to thrive if you're going to make a success of this life you need to believe the prophets and i for one believe with all my heart that ellen g white is a prophet of the lord in the same standing as malachi micah daniel or john the revelator okay as adventists that was kind of weak <laughs> But uh, I'm working with you. I'm working with you. Okay, so that's way one. Prophecy is the first way that God is informing his people that the end is nigh. And if you're studying your prophecy, you will see that the second coming is close. Second way that God informs us about the nearness of his coming. The second way is through history. History. History actually tells us about the future. Did you realize that? The Bible says so. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. The King James Version is very poetic, and it may not sink in straight away. So the New Living Translation is there for you as well. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Also in the third chapter and verse 15, it says this, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Okay, King James Version. In the New Living Translation, it makes, says it like this, what is happening now has happened before. And what will happen in the future has happened before. Because God makes the same things happen over and over again. And one more time, Isaiah chapter 46 verse 9 says this. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none else. Like me, New Living Translation, just be fair. Remember the things I've done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God and there is none like me. Now let's quote Mrs. White. And you probably know this quote, and you probably can't even anticipate the quote from Mrs. White that I'm going to give. It's from the book, um, this book, um, Council to Churches. In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance, 
to our present standing, I can say, praise God. As I see what the Lord has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. And here's this quote, we have nothing to fear for the nothing to fear the, for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. So we don't have to worry about the future, be fearful of it or anxious about it if we can simply remember how good God has been in the past. In, the, in church's history, or even in our own personal history. Because God has been good to us, hasn't he, church? Yes, he has. Okay, he has. Romans 15 verse 4 says this, For whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And Paul goes on to say this in 1 Corinthians. Now all these th things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So everything that has, been ha has happened, everything that has been written in the Bible, all that's been recorded in history are examples for us because we're living in the end times so let me give you an example of how we can learn from history about what's going to happen in the future okay so you remember the story of joseph and his multicolored green dream coat and he eventually becomes ruler of egypt and he he uh, stores up all the grain for seven years and there's seven years of plenty, just as he said. And then afterwards, after the 70 years of plenty, there then follows seven years of famine, just as he predicts. Now, in Genesis 47, we hear the account of how the Egyptians are enslaved by Pharaoh. Not the Israelites, the Egyptians are enslaved by Pharaoh because when we'll, we'll get to that so let's look at the process and you can read it in Genesis um, chapter 47 verse 13 to 23 so the first year of the famine the people say oh Pharaoh we have no food and Pharaoh says go speak to Joseph so they go off to Joseph and they say, hey, Joseph, we have no food. And Joseph says, so what, what can you give me? He says, well, we can buy um, food from you using gold and silver. Okay? So that first year, they exchanged all their gold and silver for grain. And Joseph kept them alive that first year. And the Bible says something interesting in the story. It says the money failed. It says so in the Bible. The money failed. So what does that mean? So normally, the economy works like this. I earn some money, and I need something from Joe. So I go and purchase the goods or services from Joe. Joe needs something from my friend um, Shay. And, Shay, and he, he goes and spends his money like, oh, with Shay. And then Shay needs something from me. And so the money circulates. Okay, You wish it would stay a little bit longer, but it, but it circulates. However, in Egypt at that time, all the money ended up in Pharaoh's bank account. And the money ceased to flow. So the economy, the economic system collapsed. Are we expecting an economic collapse? Are we expecting a, a great reset? Okay, it's Genesis 47. That was year one. Year two... They, they're surprised that the famine continues and they say, oh, Joseph, we, know, we, we have no food. Um, can you feed us this second year? And Joseph said, but what do you have? He, what, they said, well, we have assets. We have cattle. We have cows. We have camels. We have donkeys. We have sheep and goats. And he says, great, give me your assets and I'll feed, keep you alive. And so all the assets ended up in Pharaoh's possession. Pharaoh's possession for the second year. And um, isn't that predicted in the future? 
Doesn't the World Economic Forum say by 2030 you'll own you'll own nothing and be happy about it that you own nothing? And I'm pretty sure the people in Joseph's time were just glad to be alive. Just glad to be alive. That was year two. Year three, they kind of get smart now. And they're kind of thinking, yeah, perhaps Joseph was right all along and it's going to be a seven-year famine. And so in year three, they come together as a group, collective bargaining. They form a union. Okay, and as a union, isn't that predicted in the future? Anyway, they, as a group, they go to Joseph and say, hey, Joseph, we want to make a deal with you, not just for one year, but for the rest of the family, because we believe now that it's going to be seven years. And Joseph says, okay, what do you have for me? And they said, well, we can't hide it from you, Joseph. All we got are our lives, our bodies, and our land. Take them both, keep us alive, and we will serve you. And Joseph says, sign here on the dotted line. And so they sign over their land and their lives. And they become, they become Pharaoh's slaves. Mrs. White said, says, in the future, slavery will return because the spirit of slavery never died. And you know what the Bible says in Joseph's story in chapter 47? It says that Joseph moved them off the land and put them in cities, 15-minute cities. Isn't that predicted as well? No, the Bible doesn't say 15-minute cities. I just added that bit. <laughs> but the Bible says he moved them off the land into cities, into cities. What we see happening with Joseph, we can see and for and Forecast is going to happen in the future as well, in the very near future. The interesting thing about Joseph's story, just to wrap it up, just as a lesson of illustration and learning, there are certain people who were not enslaved. The first group, the first group was Pharaoh. Of course, he's not going to enslave himself, okay? And all his family, they weren't enslaved. The second group was Joseph and the Israelites, okay? The, the, um, Jacob came down into Egypt. They came with all their wealth, and they didn't have to use any of their wealth because Joseph provided for all their needs. So they kept all their wealth, and they became very powerful and influential in Egypt, okay? That was the second group. The third group, the third group were the priests. Everything that belonged to the priests remained with the priests. Okay, so for, for some of you who are setting up your outpost, perhaps you need to bear that in mind. If you own it as an individual, you'll lose it. But if you own it as a ministry, perhaps that's a solution to keeping hold of your ministry and your land. You know, that, so that's Joseph. We can, we, it's not just Bible stories that tell us about what's going to happen in the future. We know that Mrs. White speaks extensively about the French Revolution. And when you study what happened in the French Revolution and the anarchy and the chaos and the killing and the mayhem that occurred then, you know that it's going to be repeated in the future. So we can study history and learn from history and know what's going to happen in the future. And we can see these things happening. We can see society already breaking down. We can see the, the fracture marks, the fracture lines appearing before our very eyes. And we know it won't take much for it to implode upon us. So the first way we know about the future is through Bible prophecy. The second way we know about the future is through History, there's one more way, the third way. And the third way are through omens, omens, omens. So what's an omen? What's an omen? What's an omen? An omen is an event, an occurrence that when it happens, you feel, huh, this is odd. This is pointing to something. This, this, is, this is signifying something. It could be good or bad. You know that it's, it's out of the ordinary, and you think this occurrence is um, predicting or forecasting something else to happen. That's an omen. That's an omen. 
Jesus talks about omens. He didn't mention the words, but he talks about signs of the times. Matthew chapter 16, verse 3, talking to the religious leaders of his day, talking to the church leadership, talking to the, those in charge. He says this, O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can he not discern the signs of of the times they were unable to do it but there are people who can discern the signs of time and we hear about him in um, the sons of Issachar the children of Issachar first chronicles chapter 12 verse 32 at this time Israel was going to do a transition they're going to move from the kingdom of Saul to the kingdom of David there's going to be this transition the men of Issachar knew that there had to be a transition they knew that. They saw the signs, and, the, the, and this is recorded about them. And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. In other words, these men not only knew what time Israel were, it was in, but they also knew what to do about it. So knowing the signs is one thing, but knowing what to do is another. And you need to have both of them together. Know what times you're living in and know what to do. And the men of Issachar were such men. And I pray, I pray that you are that type of people as well. Let me give you an example of omens. An omen, please remember, an omen isn't something that's recorded as prophetic, uh, as a prophecy. So it's not a necessarily a fulfillment of prophecy, but it's pointing to prophecy about to be fulfilled. Okay, you, you're working with me, yeah? Okay, so let's, let's go to the destruction of Jerusalem. AD 70, Titus and his army has surrounded Jerusalem, okay? Surrounded Jerusalem, and they eventually take it, take the temple, destroy it, kill thousands and thousands of people, take the rest off into slavery. But before Titus came, two years earlier in AD 68, Cestius came. Cestius came. Okay? And he came with his army, surrounded Jerusalem, was about to conquer it, then he had to withdraw draw and, and, and retreat. Now, before Cestius occurs, comes with his army, there some interesting things started to happen in and around Jerusalem and the temple. And we read about it in the book, The Great Controversy. It says this, Signs and wonders appeared, foreboding disaster and doom. In the midst of the night... And a natural light shone over the temple and the altar. That's the altar of burnt sacrifice in the outer courtyard. Upon the clouds at sunset were pictured chariots and men of war gathering for battle. The priests ministering by night in the sanctuary were terrified by mysterious sounds the earth trembled and a multitude of voices were heard crying let us depart hence the great eastern gate which was so heavy that it could hardly be hardly be shut by a score of men and which was secured by immense bars of iron fastened deep in the pavement of solid stone opened at midnight without visible agencies so in and around jerusalem all these stories were flying around about the light that shone over the temple which everybody could see about pictures of chariots in the clouds about an unnatural light of the altar of burnt sacrifice people were talking about it the priests were reporting reporting hearing strange sounds let us depart heads i mean that must have been scary all these things were being talked about in the marketplaces in the places of worship in the in the homes all these things were publicly known these were omens pointing to the future fulfillment 
of prophecy. Now you need to remember this on page 30 that not one Christian died in the destruction of Jerusalem. Not one Christian, not one believer. Every believer saw the omens, heard them talked about, okay? And then when the opportunity came and Ancestius retreated, they took the opportunity to leave Jerusalem as Jesus had instructed them to. And because they were obedient and heeded the warning and left the city, not one believer died in the destruction of Jerusalem. Please remember, they heeded the warning, saw the omens, and were obedient and left the city when they had the opportunity to do so. My brothers and sisters, I want, you to, I want to tell you that the omens are all around us. All the omens pointing to the coming disaster that Jesus has predicted in Matthew chapter 24. And if we are obedient, we will see the omens, we will be obedient and follow the commands and leave in order to save our lives. Let me give you some examples of omens that we see around us. Let's start off with this one in the United States, Project 2025. I wonder if you've heard about Project 2025. So let me give you some background information. Okay, so Project 2025 it, um, is, part of, is a manifesto of ideas that a lobbying group that is supportive of the Republican Party has put together. This, this lobbying group is the Heritage Foundation. They are very influential. They are one of the most influential lobbying groups in America today. They are supported by very wealthy donors. And we know that money talks, okay? So these very wealthy donors have, have put together this manifesto of ideas called Project 2025. Um, the whole book is called Mandate for Leadership. Mandate for Leadership. And you can go online and you can pull it down. Just type in project2025.org and you'll see the web, their website come up and you can go and download a document. It's a, it's a fairly sizable document, about 900 pages. Just some interesting reading. <laughs> You've got nothing else to do. Okay, but let's, let's zoom in on what one aspect of it says there, it says this. It is not enough for conservatives to win elections. If we are going to rescue the country from the grip of the radical left, we need both a governing agenda and the right people in place ready to carry out this agenda, carry this agenda out on day one of the next conservative administration. So let me give put this into context for you. So the next, next administration will start January the 20th. Okay, they're gonna be sworn in January the 6th, I believe it is. There's going to, the elections on November the 4th, but they don't start work until January the 20th. And when they hit the ground, they want to hit the ground running. The last time Trump won, um, became president, he spent the first four or five months just recruiting his team and they saw that as a waste of time so they are already recruiting the team training them and they are currently moving them to washington dc in anticipation of a republican victory so this is all part of their playbook their the ideas this is what we need to be doing in order to win okay and this is all on their website this is all on the website. So they say playbook, the 180-day playbook. The time is short and conservatives need a plan. The project will create a playbook of actions to be taken in the first 180 days of the new administration to bring quick relief to Americans suffering from the left's devastating policies. So they're saying this is what they want to implement. So if they came into power 
um, took up the reins of power January 20th. By July 19th, they want to see these ideas implemented, implemented in the United States. Okay, and all the ideas are in this document, Mandate for Leadership. And if we flick through to page 589, it literally looks like this. And since you can't read that, let me zoom in for you. And this is what it says, and I've just cut it out for you. It says, Sabbath rest. Sabbath rest. God ordained the Sabbath as a day of rest. And until very recently, the Judeo-Christian tradition sought to honor that mandate by moral and legal regulation of work on that day. Moreover, a shared day off makes it possible for families and communities to enjoy time off together rather than as atomized individuals and provides a, a healthier cadence of life for everyone. Unfortunately, the communal day of rest, that is the Sabbath, has eroded under the pressures of consumerism and secularism especially for low-income workers. So this is the introduction. This is talking about what is a problem. Before we address it, they say, this is what we're seeing. This is what the problem is. They're saying there is no more Sabbath rest. There is no more common day off. We all are do our different things on different days. That's what they're saying is a problem. Now, this is their solution. Congress should encourage communal rest by amending the Fair Labor Standards Act to require that workers be paid time and a half for hours worked on the Sabbath. That day would default to Sunday, except for employers with a sincere religious observance of a Sabbath at a different time, e.g. Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. The obligation would transfer to that pe period instead. Houses of worship and, and people who require to work all the, around the clock would be exempt, okay? That's what the rest of it says. So what they're saying is this. So if, if your boss is an evangelical, okay, and, and you work for him, and um, if he wants you to come in on Sunday, he then has to pay you time and a half to have you work on Sunday. Okay? Work on Sunday. Now, it's saying that if you, ob if you object, if you object to working on Sabbath, whatever, and say, well, my Sabbath is Saturday, okay, it doesn't really matter because it says it's the employer's conviction. So unless you're working for a Jew or a Seventh-day Adventist or another Sabbath-keeping um, Christian group, then it will default to Sunday. And this is what they are proposing to be implemented by July 19, 2025, if, there's a big if, if they come into power. Power. And the, this it, there's some more spiel that goes on. I'm just going to highlight a little bit towards the end. It says this. The proper role of government in helping to enable individuals to practice their religion is to reduce barriers to work options and to fruitful employer and employee relations. In other words, they're saying the government has a role to play in helping you worship. Now we know, we know that the, the Sunday law comes in in four parts, and we'll be talking about this later on during the weekend, four stages to the Sunday law. The, this, what we see here is the beginning of step one of the Sunday law. Step one of the Sunday law, 2025. If, if they win and go ahead with it, okay? Now, this is all part of the Heritage Foundation. So the Heritage Foundation, let's just see what Wikipedia says about it, okay? The Heritage Foundation, sometimes referred to simply as Heritage, is an American conservative 
think tank based in Washington, D.C., and founded in 1973. It took a leading role in the conservative movement in the 1980s during the pres presidency of Ronald Reagan, whose policies were taken from Heritage Foundation studies, including its mandate for leadership. So this is a new thing. Every time there's an election cycle, they release another mandate for leadership. The Heritage Foundation has had significant influence in US public policy making and has historically been ranked among the most influential public policy organizations in the United States. So this isn't no small group that's pushing this. This is a major significant lobbying group that is calling for it. Okay. Oh, let me read part of this page, the second paragraph. Heritage Action works with lawmakers to implement Heritage Foundation solution, while it also organizes nearly 20,000 sentinel activists and more than 2 million local grassroots activists around the nation to push for their adoption. So they're working on various levels. First of all, they're working in the Houses of Congress, working with lawmakers, trying to push their policies. Then they have people on the ground, 20,000 uh, people on the ground, implementing their policies locally, and also 2 million people who are at the grassroots who are supporting them. So who's behind the Heritage Foundation? The Heritage Foundation is, its president is Kevin D. Roberts. And he became president in 2021. Now, he ha he's, let me, let me just read to this, read this, you this. Kevin D. Roberts is a Catholic. He has a strong faith-based conservatism that he traces back to his childhood in Lafayette, Louisiana. Roberts is a lifelong educator and historian, and he has served in various roles that align with his faith. In other words, he only takes a job on if he can bring his faith into work with him. He was the founder of the of John Paul the Great Academy, a K-12 Catholic liberal arts school in Lafayette, Louisiana. He also served as a president of Wyoming Catholic College. Currently, he is a president of the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank based in Washington, DC. His faith plays a significant role in his work and leadership. So Kevin D. Roberts, who's in charge of the Heritage Foundation, is a Catholic, and his faith, his Catholic faith, plays a significant part in what he does. Mrs. White says this in the book, Last Day Events, a book I hope you, hopefully you've read, the Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue, and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. Let me just stop there. For ex let me just blank that for a second. So she's saying there are people who are jumping on board who don't realize how far it's going to go. So for example, for example, um, we have um, a politician, a Seventh-day Adventist politician by the name of Dr. Ben Carson. Have you heard of him? Dr. Ben Carson, he's a Seventh-day Adventist. He's written a part of this mandate for leadership. He's written a part for it. And he's also stood up for um, other um, actions. For example, the, the law in Louisiana where, they, um, where, the, where the schools have to display a poster size display of the Ten Commandments in each classroom. He stood up for it even though the state is mandating in the areas of religion, literally breaking down the separation between church and state. 
and he doesn't really see he doesn't really see where this is going and how dangerous this is he goes on to say this they are working in blindness they do not see that if a Protestant government sacrifices the principles that make them a free, independent nation and through legislation brings into the Constitution principles that will propagate papal falsehood and papal delusions, they are plunging into the Roman horrors of the Dark Ages. Okay? So, then, um, earlier this year, Louisiana... Um, legislated that all classrooms in public schools had to display a poster size um, picture of the Ten Commandments, hoping that that will make kids more moral. Okay, and um, that is supported at all levels, even though this is breaking down the separation of church and state because the church shouldn't be legislating anything in the areas of religion. Okay, but it's breaking down that separation. The third most powerful person in America is a person called Mike Johnson. He's Speaker of the House. And he is in support of that legislation. Okay? He's in support of it. Now, this, you know, he's a, he's a Republican as well. Now, Project 2025, the Louisiana law, um, the Oklahoma law, that has also been passed, these are all Republican things. I'm not suggesting that Democrats are any better. Okay, the two sides of the same coin. Okay, they'll just bring in the Sunday law for different reasons. In the tablet, the tablet is a Catholic newspaper, a regular Catholic newspaper. And in the tablet in January 2020, there's this article The Sabbath in an Era of Climate Change. And it's written by a chap called Jonathan Schorsch. And it says this I believe that the tradition. Jewish framework, sorry, the traditional Jewish framework of the kinds of activities forbidden on Shabbat have an excellent guideline for us today for environmental reasons, whether or not one believes in God or cares for organized religion. I am calling for flexible but maximal observance of a weekly day of rest, whether it is Saturday, Sunday, or Friday, for different people or in different places. So this person's writing this article in this Catholic newspaper. That means the Catholic newspaper agrees with the sentiments of this article. And he's saying, we need to be observing a weekly day of rest. So let's find, about, find out about Jonathan Scorch who wrote this. Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Scorch is actually a Jew. Jonathan is the founder and director of the Jewish Activism Summer School in Berlin. He's the director and founder of the Green Sabbath Project. He serves as professor of Jewish religious and intellectual history at the University of Stadt Potsdam. Okay? So that's Jonathan Scott. He's writing about it and he's promoting um, a day off a week, one day off a week, in, in order... To, for the environment. So this Green Sabbath Project, have you heard about the Green Sabbath Project? You know, so you know all about it. The Green Sabbath Project saying that we need to be taking a day off for the environment. We need to be resting for the environment. Now it can be, it's going to start off with any day of the week, but eventually they're going to say we need to coordinate to maximize the impact of it. And they're going to coordinate it around Sunday as a day off. Okay, so and we know that the Democratic Party in the United States are more inclined, more believers in the in climate change. The Republican Party, not so much. The Democrats definitely are into climate change. And so they are all for the Green Sabbath Project. And it's not just political parties, it's commentators, it's newspaper articles, it's podcast, everywhere there is this chatter and this talk and this ongoing con conversation about keeping the Sabbath as a day of rest. For example, in the Washington Post, January 2024, the, the columnist wrote this, why reviving a 2,600-year-old spiritual practice made my life better? 
On the verge of, of burnout a few years ago, I began to practice a Sabbath. And the whole article talks about how he, how, how he was and how he started practicing Sabbath and how it's benefited him. So he's not doing it for the environment. He's not doing it for religious reasons. He's doing it just for himself. So for a variety of reasons, we have different people say, it's time we start keeping the Sabbath. It's time we start keeping the Sabbath. An omen, an omen, an omen. Mrs. White says this. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 122, paragraph 3. We have far more to fear from, from where? From within than from without. In other words, if you're going to be scared... Don't be scared of the evangelicals or, or the, the Catholics or, or, the, or Islam. Be worried about what's happening inside our church. We have far more to fear from within. The rest of the paragraph, the hindrances to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. In other words, we are our own worst enemies. And believers have a right to expect that those who profess to be keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will do more than any other class to promote and honor by their consistent lives and their godly example and their active influence the cause which they represent. Then it goes on to say this. No, then it then we have this, just looking at what's happening within inside our church. This is in Advent Messenger. The Office of Regional Conference Ministries of SDH pro prominently displays the three angels of Revelation 14 with rainbow colors. Why rainbow colors? Sorry? LGBT, LGBT. So let me just break it, break it down. So within the United States, you have... Uh, in most places, black conferences and white conferences, okay, to this day. Black conferences and white conferences to this day. Now, the, white, the black conferences have an uh, a organizational, organizational, organizational head in the North American Division offices. And it's, the, and it's on their website that they um, took their banner and put the three angels in it and covered them in the rainbow flag. And they did it in June. Why June? Because it's Pride Month. June was Pride Month. So in sympathy, to in harmony, to um, show some solidarity with people who have an LGBTQ plus inclination or leaning, they, they had their banner, the website banner, in the rainbow colors. We have far more to fear from within than from without okay and it's not just talking about lgbtq plus it's not just in the seventh day adventist church we have a female uh, there's this article um, from last year female pastor calls controversy referring to god as non-binary do you do, do you know what these terms mean okay and jesus with two dads the Edina Community Lutheran Church in Minnesota has become a viral sensation after one of its female Lutheran pastors, Anne Helgen, delivered a Sparkle Creed prayer during a Sunday service live stream in celebration of LGBT Pride Month. During the prayer, Helgen recited a statement of faith known as the Sparkle Creed. Have you ever heard the Sparkle Creed? So you're going to hear it now. So I'm going to play a video. And hopefully this sound will come through. So this may be educational to you. But just listen to what they're saying in the Sparkle Creed. I invite you to rise in body or spirit. And let us confess our faith today in the words of the Sparkle Creed. I believe in the non-binary God whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus Christ, their child, who wore a fabulous tunic and had two dads, and saw everyone as a sibling child of God. I believe in the rainbow spirit 
who shatters our image of one white light and refracts it into a rainbow of gorgeous diversity. I believe in the church of everyday saints as numerous, creative, and resilient as patches on the ace quilt, whose feet are grounded in mud and whose eyes gaze at the stars in wonder. I believe in the calling to each of us that love is love is love. So beloved, let us love. I believe, glorious God, help my unbelief. Amen. Don't say amen. <laughs> that is a spark of read. So why is that significant? Because where our evangelical friends go, we follow. And soon we'll be seeing things similar to this in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, so you've, some of you are thinking, that will never happen. Aren't you? Some of you are thinking, that will never, ever happen. Okay? Let's, just to prove the point, this is Roanoke Church. I know Roanoke Church. I know some of the members there personally. Okay? It's in Virginia. And they, um, let me just read it. And this is from Adventist Today. Adventist Today is a publication which um, publishes articles very much in favor with um, denominations, standing, and viewpoints. Okay, the Potomac Conference has asked the Roanoke Church to reconsider a seminar to be presented by independent ministry speaker Stephen Ball. The church board invited Ball to deliver a series on prophecy at May 9 to 5, May 5 to 6, 2023. The church is currently between assigned pastors. Okay, so the Potomac Conference is asking one of its churches, the Roanoke Church, to reconsider and to take back an invitation that they have extended to Pastor Stephen Ball. Okay, now what is policy? Conference policy is that invitations made by local churches for speakers from outside the conference and particularly those from controversial ministries should be approved by the conference. Some denominational leaders have expressed concerns about Ball, Pastor Stephen Ball. His, his ministry is called Some TV. Have any of you watched Stephen Ball? Okay, and, you know, I think Stephen Ball is a very solid preacher. If you want to know a particular doctrine, Stephen Ball is going to break it down for you, and you will understand it after you've watched it. He may not be the most dynamic, but he's definitely the most thorough, one of the most thorough in his teachings, okay? So this is what they say. In relation, this is the, their objection, in, why they object to him. In relation to his opposition to women's ordination, Okay, so Stephen Ball opposes women ordination. But that's GC policy, is it not? Yes, it is, GC policy. And Potomac Conference is the conference in the North American division who has ordained more women pastors than any other conference in defiance to GC policy. So in relation to women's ordination, Ball questions the full divinity of Christ. Ball parallels the headship of man over woman in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 to 3, was the headship of the Father over Jesus, claiming that Jesus was begotten into eternity by the Father and born from his bosom. I don't actually think that that is actually correct, what they're saying about Stephen Ball. And he's advocating, the last thing they object to, is advocating for last generation theology. Do you know what last generation theology is? Last generation theology basically says that there's going to be a generation of people who are going to see Jesus for Christ comes, the last generation. And that last generation of believers are going to be living life in a particular way. And they're going to be upholding the standard, they're going to be uh, perfect in Christ, and the, they're all this, these things, okay? And they, they, they don't believe in the last generation theology. They don't believe in that, okay? So that's Potomac Conference, okay? He's against Stephen Ball. Remember, we're talking about LGBTQ+. Okay. Also, the very same conference who cancelled Stephen Ball approves a pro-LGBTQ plus symposium. 
Okay? The Potoka Conference has ordained more women in violation of SDA Adventist ordination standards than any other conference. They are a big part of the reason that the Columbia Union is in the formal warning from the GC Executive Committee uh, as of 2019. So this symposium that they are promoting, sorry, symposium that they're promoting has this guy. This is Paul Anthony, Paul Anthony. And he also had Alicia Turner. Alicia Turner is bisexual. She was a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. She was. Um, she was removed from her office and as, because she came out as bisexual. And then Paul Anthony is openly homosexual. He's trained to be a minister and he's looking for employment as a minister. Okay? And the, the, the Potomac Conference... Um, even though the council Steve Abor has approved of this symposium about LGBTQ+. Okay? So what I'm saying to you, even within the church, there are issues that we are aware of that are showing us that we're living in the last days. Even these past couple of weeks, there's been a lot of um, talk online about Dr. Conrad Vine and his comments and all of that. All these are showing us that we are living in the end times. All of these are omens that we need to pay attention to and then ask ourselves, what should we be doing? Now I'm going to wrap up now, but I'm going to let you know that there's loads and loads of things that we could be showing you as omens because there's all this walk about, talk about civil war and how... Canada's preparing for civil war in America, um, how the U.S. Uh, is talking about uh, uh, currently in a cold civil war state, okay? Online, there are people outside are saying that America's heading into a civil war. In Texas and other states, there are secessionists. Secessionists are people who want to separate themselves from the Union of the United States, and there are these groups that are popping up all over America, um, and the, most of them are in the south, as you can see here, okay? 31%, 36% in, in um, Alaska and so forth. These are a number of people who think that, you know what, we're better off outside of the union, okay? And then, then PBS, Public Broadcasting Service, one in five Americans think that violence may solve the solutions in America. 20% of Americans believe that, that, you know, violence is a legitimate reason and we, you, uh, means by solving our solutions, uh, our problems, okay? And then, of course, there was a film that came out recently, Civil War, okay? And, for, and it talks about uh, a civil war, um, Texas and California and Florida v. the rest of the Union. And this film... For its parent company, which is A24 Movies, at the time I did this, had racked up a worldwide total of $114 million. It's the biggest earning film ever. And it's not just in the movies. We have people like Ray Dialio, who's a, a, a billionaire, a multi-billionaire, who's saying that there, there's a one in three chance of a civil war in, in America, and that the civil, America is on the brink of a civil war. Mrs. White says this, in India, China, Russia, and the cities of America, thousands of men and women are dying of starvation. The moneyed men, because they have the power, control the market. They purchase at low rates all they can obtain and then sell at greatly increased prices. This means starvation to the poorer classes and will result in a civil war. A civil war. Mrs. White talking about it. This is about the Oklahoma superintendent um, ordering that Bibles be taught in all grades from 5 to 12. Okay, and then Louis, Louis, this law is passed. Okay, Mrs. White says this about the church and state. In the issue of the conflict of Christendom, of conflict or Christendom will be divided into two great classes, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, and those who worship the beast and his image and will receive his mark. Although the church and state will unite their power to compel all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark of the beast, yet the people of God will not receive 
it. So we know that the church and state will come together, will act together to control and compel. Then there's the rise of uh, Pope John Francis and his growing influence around the world. I don't know if you, um, the G7 meetings that happened a, a couple of months ago, and they invited the Pope and he intended for the very first time, he intended the G7. G7 is the leading group of Western economies. So England, United States, Canada, Japan, um, France, Germany, and some others. These are the leading economies and they had invited some other people like Argentina and some other and they had the Pope come in on this, this particular day and he was in his wheelchair and he was being wheeled around and he was shaking everybody's hand and it's a huge oval table that all these world leaders are at and then he takes his seat right at the head of the table and I thought wow this is where you want to be right at the head of the table with all the world leaders at your beck and call underneath you. You know, then there's also the growing alliance between the United Nations and the World Economic Forum. And this alliance actually started in 2019, in June 2019, and it just so happens that a certain pandemic happened at the end of that year after this alliance. Then there is this cancelling of banks, people's bank accounts in America. So if you don't believe the right thing, if you post the wrong thing, then they will cancel your bank account. That's going on in America right now, and there people are trying to sue the banks. And then there's all these talks about UFOs and uh, unidentified flying objects happening all over America. And you have people who are coming out and say, we actually have biological matter, biological matter from crashed UFOs. Okay? Um, and these are people who know. And of course, there is the growing... Um, growing um, turnout of, of various vaccines to assist your healing. That's the best way I can say online. Okay. And then the stories like this. School district urged to fire drag queen principal with history of child pornography charges. And this is in Oklahoma, okay? And you think, well, how could this possibly be? Shouldn't they be vetting? And if you, shouldn't you be on a child protection, uh, uh, sex offenders register? You shouldn't even get near the school, let alone become a teacher, let alone become the principal of the school. Wow. But this is happening in the United States. But how often have the professed advocates of the truth proved the greatest obstacles to its advancement? The unbelief indulged the doubts expressed, the darkness cherished, encouraged the presence of evil angels and opened the way for the accomplishment of Satan's devices. We could just go on and on and on, story after story after story about what's happening in our churches, what's happening around the world, all pointing to the very same thing. We are nearing the end of time, okay? Let's go back to this. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, who saw the omens, to know what Israel ought to do, and the heads of them were 200, and the brethren were at their command. We need to be men like that. You see, 2024, this year, is our year of preparation. This is our year of preparation. We should not assume that we have another year. We should, we should not just take it for granted. Oh, in 2025 or 2026, I'll do this. No, we should use 2024 as our year to prepare. Because 2025 doesn't look like a good year. With a possible economic collapse, more natural disaster, maybe a civil war around the world, increasing climate change and, 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 um, and, the, and other pandemics that occur. There's also the emergence, the coming of the hierarchy. If you know anything about the occult, there is a, the, the occult world has a messianic figure and he's meant to arrive, the hierarchy is meant to appear in 2025. All these things are simply pointing to one thing. Jesus Christ's coming is soon. 
And we as a people can't go on blindly week after week, month after month, assuming that everything is going to get back to normal. No, it's not. We've got to get ready. And if we do not get ready, the storm is going to come upon us as an overwhelming surprise. We need to be ready. God is constantly, daily communicating um, what's happening around us to the world. As we were driving, Joe, Joe and myself yesterday, I was flicking through the BBC's website and I saw an article about um, the, the Pope and how he was, he's in Indonesia and he's, he was calling out, he was calling out um, um, to his two great concerns. The first concern is climate change, okay? His second concern are religious extremists. Religious extremists. Now, who would he consider to be a religious extremist? Who could he consider to be a religious extremist? Somebody who does not go along with the common good, with a social policy. Somebody who doesn't want to comply with the laws. Somebody like an Adventist who wants to continue to worship on the Sabbath. All the signs are happening around us. It's time for us to wake up. Let's pray. Our Father God, we want to thank you for being present with us. We want to thank you that you are surrounding us with evidence after evidence after evidence that your coming is soon. I pray there, Lord, that your people awaken out of slumber, that they will trim their lamps, and that they will go forth ready to meet the bridegroom. So that when you come in the clouds of glory, and the clouds are rolled back as a scroll, and the trumpet of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ rise up. When you come there, Lord, help us to be there to welcome you with our hands wide open, saying, Lo, this is our God. And may we hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. And for this, it would have been worth it all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.